So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us in the community-based adaptation CVA 15 forums, first thematic workshop of the innovation for adaptation stream. My name is Sushila and I'm working as program manager for managing risks through economic development, a multi-country resilience flagship program of Mercy Corps. And I will be your technical facilitator for today. So our session today is called Innovating to Improve the Ownership, Sustainability and Multiple Actor Nature of Community-Based Adaptation, a discussion and challenge initiated with examples from Uganda and Nepal. So let's start with the basic, uh, basic housekeeping rules. Uh, the meeting is recorded and some part of it will be available on the website at the latter date. So we, uh, we have taken security precautions and discourage uninvited participants to join or post inappropriate comments. If you see any such content, please notify us through the chat function and we will remove them immediately. Please uh, do not share the link to join this meeting on social media as this is the number one source for Zoom bombing. And for the best meeting experience, please close the non-essential applications like Skype and Zoom. Teams, sorry. Uh, by now, you have been familiarized with the Zoom. Uh, next, please. Yeah. By now, you have been familiarized with the Zoom, but uh, let me run through the icons and its function on the Zoom. Uh, we request you to mute, mute your microphone and only unmute it in a breakout session, which will be a latter today or if the host requested you to do so. Uh, but you are welcome to open your webcam a video for the live experience of this uh, uh, session. And uh, if your bandwidth support, uh, and if, if the video, uh, if the bandwidth does not support, uh, we request you to turn off your video as well. Uh, you can see the participant uh, icon, yeah and uh, they and, uh, can interact with the host using the icons as well. So please use the chat function for your comments and questions. Add your organizational affiliation to the questions as well so that it will be easy for us to identify you. Uh, the share screen and the recording are disabled for participants. Uh, so you will not be allowed to use that. Uh, finally, if you are having some technical difficulties, please message to the host via the chat box so that the uh, uh, issues can be solved. So that was the basic housekeeping rule and uh, we would like to welcome you back in this session. So if you want to update your name, you can uh, go in the participants and then select more and rename yourself with your name and your organization name, if you wish to. Next. Yeah, so this was the basic housekeeping rules and uh, we'd like to welcome you back to the session. So let me share with you the modality of our session today. We'll start with the keynote from uh, different personalities today covering the development sector, donor and a private sector. Then we will hear from the presenter from Nepal and Uganda team and we will break out to the breakout rooms to discuss further uh, on how we can innovate to improve the adaptation in multi-actor nature of community-based adaptation. We are excited to have you all here to kick off this innovation for adaptation stream by discussing the sustainability of adaptation actions and how that can be improved through working with multiple actors, especially focusing on private sector and developing enterprises. So without further delay, let's begin with hearing from the keynote speaker. I would like to introduce Mr. Chet Samang, uh, working in the capacity of Regional Program Director for Mercy Corps. Chet is leading the Managing Risks through Economic Development Emirate Program, one of the flagship program on disaster and climate resilience in Mercy Corps. Uh, the program aimed to build resilience of vulnerable communities and households to flood, landslide, and other climate-related shocks and stresses in Nepal. Indonesia and Timor-Leste. He has more than 16, 16 years of experience in national and international development, specializing in developing and managing disaster climate change resilience program with extensive field experience in emergency response and recovery, DRR, WASH, water resource management, DRM, and Chet holds a master's degree in interdisciplinary water resource management and a bachelor's degree in civil engineer. Chet, the floor is yours. Thank you, Susila. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be part of uh, 15 CBA conference and, and deliver a keynote in this session of innovating to improve the ownership, sustainability, and multi-actor nature of community-based adaptation. Um, let me first touch on why we are here. Um, as highlighted in the session title, this uh, discussion will focus on importance of multi-stakeholder partnership in CBA. And we believe that this is uh, important to sustain the effort or, um, or results that agencies put into uh, to build the capacity of most vulnerable uh, to be resilient to climate related shock and stresses. Particularly our focus will be on how we can incentivize the private sector engagement towards the local action. Uh, we have two innovation stories to inform um, uh, uh, discussions on the hidden potential for adaptation through uh, enterprise. But there is much more to explore and learn from all the participants here, as there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. A model um, that works in one context may not be applicable in, in another place. Um, as the social, economical, political, ecological factors may affect the uptake, replication, and sustainability of approach or interventions. Uh, we will hear about the unique uh, context, problem, and um, approach uh, taken in two different continents that promotes the multi-stakeholder partnership, particularly with the private sectors. Uh, we hope the discussions will reveal more innovative uh, approaches and potential for adaptation through market and, and enterprise. Uh, as this year also, the CVA has to be done virtually due to the pandemic, and I hope everyone is safe coping and adapting well with the COVID. Uh, currently, the COVID situation has reminded again that uh, dealing with the global crisis isn't possible without a wider and, and diverse multi-stakeholder partnership. For the first time in, in our history, we have seen uh, the rapid development and deployment of COVID vaccine, which was never, never seen before. Um, COVID is still spreading, but it would have been more disastrous and chaotic if there wasn't the commitment of the government and the private sectors uh, uh, in partnership. This also applies to the climate change adaptation uh, work. Uh, CBA approach has evolved since its emergence in early 2000s. Since then, the importance and the role of multiple stakeholders has also evolved. The, the early stage of climate change work was focused on intensive research to build evidences of climate change and its impact and to advocate for climate change. However, immediate attention for community-based adaptation was also realized uh, to build the capacity of communities to absorb, adapt, and transform in the face of climate-related shock and stress. Uh, the, climate, the global climate discourse continued is emphasizing the commitment of Global North donor and government, which resulted in increasing financing for CBO work. Um, and also the community-based approach also have been found to be very effective. However, the, the sustainability of an approach or interventions post-program uh, has remained a challenge. We have learned that uh, sustainability of an approach or interventions also depend on the scalability of the approach. Uh, but the scalability isn't possible uh, without ownership and replication with the engagement of the wider stakeholders and more importantly, investment from the private sector as well. Uh, particularly, there is more scope for private sector engagement as the private sectors are risk covers. The engagement investment isn't at the level that we expect or we need. Uh, the conventional corporate social responsibility models are found to be tied to the private sector business uh, development model. Hence, it's time to think of a, of a different approach where we can find a win-win situation for stakeholders, whether it's a public, uh, private, or civil society. Uh, in addition, uh, context also plays a big role when it comes to the ownership uh, from the government and incentivizing the private sector uh, to invest in CBA-related activities. We've seen uh, same programs with the similar level of efforts in delivering different results just because of the financial and technical capacity of the government, and particularly um, the weak market also uh, limiting the sustainability and scalability of the approach that we uh, are promoting. 
all of this uh, affects the ability of vulnerable householder community to be resilient to climate related shock and stress. Uh, and today we are fortunate to have a group of very diverse speakers representing donors, private sectors, and CSOs to share their experience. We have learned a lot from communities uh, that we serve. Uh, so we do from participants present here today. We'd love to hear what different or how differently we should work to promote a multi-stakeholder partnership in community-based adaptation. Uh, let me stop there. And uh, as we have other speakers, to add more as well. So thank you, over to you, Susila. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you for setting the scene and sharing the objective of today's discussion as well. I truly echo to you that it's time, it's a hard time now to think the different approaches where we can find the win-win situation for all stakeholders, either it's public, private, or civil society. So now we have a Gabriela Mercurio, who leads the innovation program at City Alliance, a social, sociologist with specialization in urban governance. Gabriela is interested in strategies to strengthen civil society and co-create inclusive, equitable, and sustainable cities. Gabriela, we have heard about the need of multiple stakeholder engagement and leadership on community-based action. Uh, representing the donor community, can you please highlight the critical role in supporting innovation overall and how to incentivize the private sector in adaptation questions? Up, uh, the floor is yours, Gabriela. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also thank you for this space to collaborate. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. So for me, a very straightforward reason why um, we need to support innovation is that, put simply, business as usual will not lead us to a fair and equal society. So we just need to look at the levels of inequality and poverty to quickly realize that change is needed. And that means who has the decision-making power, who has access to and control over resources, um, who gets to contribute and who gets excluded. So in that sense, for instance, when we are selecting the projects that we will be able to support, we look into how vulnerable groups are involved, how gender is mainstreamed, um, and how equality is sought. The second important point for me is more about the understanding of innovation. So in our, what, what do we mean by innovation? So in our case, we don't consider only disruptive, disruptive innovations or the use of shiny new technologies with difficult names. Um, we rather look into new developments or adaptations of things that already exist in areas such as fostering collaboration, raising awareness, co-creating. So in our selection, we value creativity in the approach that is being proposed. And most importantly, it needs to create value to and work for those that you're proposing to support. So we really look for initiatives that are built upon local knowledge and collective construction. And we need to take into account that some new technologies available, they are pretty good tools, which in some cases can really help achieve um, your goal. But in others can also be a problem because we cannot ignore, for instance, the digital divide or um, that these technologies may not be simply appropriate for the local context. So we cannot disconnect the issues. And for me, this is one of the key points when we talk about innovation. And on the question on providing incentives to the private sector, and here I have in mind um, not the bigger players, you know, with national or international outreach, but rather the micro and small enterprises. And I would say awareness raising is needed. Climate related shocks also have an impact on businesses directly or indirectly. Access to funding and capacity building so they can also innovate from their side and respond locally to the new markets demands um, that may emerge during the adaptation actions. But we also cannot ignore the relevance of an enabling environment. So the role of policies and regulatory frameworks that facilitate and provide direct incentives and also help new local enterprises to flourish. And I must say, I'm really glad that the discussion on the private sector involvement is taking place today. Um, in our innovation program, we provide a peer learning platform. And one of the sessions that we held with uh, the organization selected under the Climate Adaptation Initiative focused exactly on engaging the ecosystem. And there was a consensus on the need to involve diverse stakeholders. This was not questioned. 
but um, one of the three groups, uh, out of the three groups the, of stakeholders that we discussed, which were the communities, local governments, and private sector, effective private sector engagement was considered um, the most challenging. So I think there is need, um, there is a need for for us to learn with each other and the sectors to learn how to work with each other. So I'm very eager for this discussion with the broader CBA community and the opportunity to reflect upon other points of view and get inspired by the participants. Thank you very much, Sushila, back to you. Thank you so much, Gabriela. It was really wonderful to hear about that. You, you shared that business as usual will not lead us to fair and equitable society. I truly echo that uh, with you. And yes, uh, the, the shiny new technologies, yes, they are, they are really hard to digest to. The one who are like so experienced, it will be tough for the community to digest that as well. Thank you so much for your uh, insights. And uh, we also had uh, Sandra. Uh, Sandra was uh, passionate about using technology to create business and social impact. She is the Ghana's country director for VMO technology, a cross-cutting social enterprise using mobile technology. Uh, but she can't join us due to, as you mentioned, the digital thing. Actually, sorry, I'm here. Can you hear me? I'm here. Ah, oh, Sandra, thanks so much. You are here. Okay. Uh, Sandra is uh, is uh, the Ghana's country director for VMO Technology, a cross-cutting aid social enterprise using mobile technology to drive behavior change communication and evidence gathering for private and public sector players in agriculture, health, financial inclusion, and several others uh, used in Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. Sandra has 15 years of uh, management experience in marketing, sales, strategy, and payment consulting for multinationals, including Vodafone, uh, Mixeni, and companies. She also has experience working with tech startups and having managed uh, Tontone.com, one of the Ghana's largest online marketplace. Sandra attended Oman College and she is a strong advocate for female empowerment and leadership. She has the BA in economics and master's in social business and enterprise. Sandra, you have heard about this session and also about the discussion we are initiating today. And as a private sector, uh, we want to hear from you what motivated you or how you get involved with these adaptation projects and programs. And also as a development practitioners, we are saying like we are facing challenge on, on, uh, uh, on uh, incentivizing private sector, pulling the private sector on the board. Can you please share your perspective and how you are dealing with it. Over to you, Sandra. Great, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I can't vouch for the internet here in Ghana this morning, so I won't be able to put my video on, but you can hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. So um, I think for me, how did I get involved in this? Um, I've been, I've always been, you know, very passionate about engaging communities in a way that meets the community where they are. So, you know, to the points that were raised about using technology that sometimes is over the heads of the people that you're dealing with, I really identify with that. And that's why at Viamo, we really make sure that we are using um, a combination of low tech and high tech. And what I mean by that is we're doing uh, SMS in some areas, we're doing local language IVR, which is um, interactive voice response. So uh, sort of the same thing we hear when you call your bank. Um, and we're using, you know, things like remote training, job aids for extension officers, um, for health um, community workers. So really uh, meeting the community where they are. And I think for me, that's what really resonates because I've seen it work. Um, I've seen communities who, uh, you know, are trying to share information about COVID. Uh, how are you going to do that? Because they don't have access to, not everybody has an access to a TV. Um, they might have a radio, but, you know, that at the time that they are, you know, the, the news is on or the information is on, they might be in the farm, especially for women, you know, doing a lot of housework. They don't have time to just be glued to something you know, all the time. So what we do a lot of is use mobile phones uh, in Ghana and a lot of the places that we work, the mobile phone penetration is really high. It's usually higher than radio and TV. And so we end up using that to uh, put information in the hands of the community. So doing this in local languages. So we are disrupting barriers to distance and to, um, to literacy. 
And I found that that really is a powerful tool and it's something that I passionately enjoy. And therefore that's how I, you know, that's how come I got involved in this. Um, now on the question of getting the private sector involved, I think I said in so many um, discussions that uh, speak about this. And for me, I, I, I really think it's a, it's a question of finding the sweet spot where you know public and private sector meet so pub private sector what do we care about we care about you know making impact but also making money and i think that it's really the only way in which you can be successful doing um, cba and really anything else that involves the private sector there has to be something in there for the private sector to you know meet that double aspiration of making impact and also making money and for us at viamo we're a social enterprise we're using technology, mobile technology, to engage, you know, communities and to engage our partners and to support them in their work. And so, you know, it makes sense because we're able to meet both the impact and also make money while we're doing it. We work with a lot of organizations, including the, um, you know, ministries from the government, from the private sector, and then also from the development organization. So, for me, I think it's about making sure that whatever CBA engagement that we're in we're meeting those two needs of what's in it for the private sector. Is there an opportunity for them to make impact and make money while doing this? And I'll give an example. Um, there have been times when we have done work in the community and, um, you know, for example, in a farming community, and we've provided information about, you know, say agronomic tips or, you know, things that can help the farming community grow better cocoa, better products, better crops, and at the end of it, um, it's basically a combination between um, donor funding and then also the community wanting to actually pay for those services because they see the value and the impact of that in their lives. And so I think more and more, if we are able to find solutions that, you know, maybe first start off with some funding just to get the community engaged and on board, and then eventually uses, you know, um, applications like mobile money to enable the community to pay for these services themselves, then I think we have a winning proposition because in that way, you're both helping the community. They see value in it. They are willing to pay even if it's like a little bit uh, because the communities tend to be quite large and you can pull them all together. There's actually the opportunity for the private sector player to make some money from it and make some margin from it. Then you have a really you know, strong proposal for how this can be sustainable. So for me, I think it's it's um, it's all of these things, and and the more we we do the, this kind of work, the more we find out what works and what doesn't work. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sandra. You really highlighted that uh, the value uh, should be realized by communities so that they can also invest a little bit of their money on it so that it will be sustainable. It was a really good insight. And yeah, truly for private sector to be get involved, we need both the impact and money on the ground. So both things can be put on. Uh, thank you so much, uh, all three keynote speakers. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your insights and your different perspectives and pictures uh, so that it helped us frame uh, today's discussion and we can further discuss this through uh, the two innovative stories from Nepal and Uganda and then we have a breakout session where we uh, I hope you will be you you all will be staying till the breakout session as well to support our participants if they have any questions or queries uh, in the meantime uh, participants if you have any questions or queries or any feedbacks or or want to echo these speakers please use the chat function uh, we will be seeing the chat functions as well uh, so for now, uh, we want to welcome Ganesh from Marshiko and Stefan from Three Adopts in Uganda to share their experience and stories from their countries. Uh, so I would like you to introduce yourself and start your presentation. Over to you, Ganesh. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, over um, to you, Ganesh. Uh, thank you, Susila. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Ganesh Bhatta from Marshiko, Nepal. Um, I shared by our moderator, Susila, who will be sharing the stories of two countries uh, from two different continents, Asia and uh, the Africa. Um, so we'll be discussing about uh, innovation to uh, improve the ownership and uh, sustainability in the multi-actor nature of community-based adaptation. Uh, taking a reference from a case from Managing Risk Through Economic Development Program of Nepal. Stefan, please. 
Hello everyone. Uh, this is Stephen Bright Zakwa uh, from Uganda and working with Tree Adoption Uganda. I'm really excited to share and also get to know uh, what you, you have for us as far as community-based adaptation is concerned. Uh, next slide, please. So um, many of you might know about Nepal, um, and uh, but some of you uh, might not. Uh, so firstly, I want to share where Nepal is. Um, Nepal is between India and uh, uh, China, the red pointed area in the world map uh, toward the right is Nepal, uh, which is also known as, uh, as, as the uh, country of Mount Everest, Stephen. Yes, uh, Uganda on the other side is on the African continent in East Africa, and it's also known as the Pearl of Africa. Um, so next, next slide, please. So um, this is a full map of Nepal. Uh, we work in far western corner of uh, the country. Uh, today we will be focusing on uh, Dharadhara district. Uh, the geography of uh, this district is uh, plains as well as hills. Uh, the land is fragile, uh, which is also known as a young mountain, and the uh, soil texture is mixed of mud and small stone. Um, so uh, our community has been facing a multi-hazard like flood, um, landslide, uh, drought, uh, windy storm, a uh, cold wave, uh, among many. Uh, so every year during the uh, rainy season, people of this area face uh, problems like landslide, river cutting, and uh, flooding, and uh, which cause uh, destruction like loss of life, agriculture, land, and property. Um, so due to the uh, changing climate and uh, uncertainty of precipitation, uh, severity of these hazard are increasing in Nepal. Um, uh, so our communities are fighting with these um, challenges and uh, in an annual basis. Um, Stephen, next slide, please. Yes, uh, and in Uganda, we have uh, uh, a slum known as Boise it is found in the capital Kampala. It is one of the most impoverished places uh, in the country and so much uh, impacted by floods. First, because uh, it's in a low lying area, but also because uh, the drainage channels are not sufficient enough to carry off uh, running water whenever they are erratic rain. And this is made worse by poor waste management, uh, which is uh, caused by uh, the waste management system, which requires that uh, every person pays for their own waste. The fact that uh, most people here are of low socioeconomic status and survive on less than $2 a day means that most of them are not willing to pay for a collection of waste so they end up uh, dumping it indiscriminately. And as you can see in the first picture there, it ends up blocking drainage channels. And whenever it rains, uh, it floods into households, uh, leading to loss of lives, uh, loss of livelihoods, as well as destruction to property. And as you can see in the picture down there, the lady, it's the women who are affected most because uh, they spend the biggest parts of the day at their homes together with children. And then they have to uh, drain their houses, something which exposes them to diseases and hazards. Um, so um, now, uh that we have shared about the problems in our communities uh, from two uh, different countries. Uh, so we want to hear your innovative uh, ideas as well in Menti. Uh, please uh, share what can be the innovative ideas to improve uh, traditional DRRCCA practices. 
So for those who need assistance, please visit www.menti.com and uh, enter uh, uh, the code for 009422. Uh, you can also find the link in uh, link and uh, detail in the chat box. So Stephen, please can you uh, drop uh, Menti and uh, pass uh, password in the uh, in the chat box. Um, we will be waiting for three minutes, um, uh, maximum two minutes to take your innovative idea. Um, and uh, if anybody fails to log in Menti, you can also put your idea in chat box. Yeah, working with local faith communities and uh, faith-based organization. Yeah, local skills, high skills, tool and uh, knowledge. Yeah, harassing uh, local knowledge. So I will thank you everyone. Uh, we have heard many different innovative ideas from across the world. Uh, now we want to share what we did to overcome this challenge. Um, I will start uh, first from Nepal. Okay, so uh, while working in, on disaster and climate change sector, uh, Marshikur uh, realized only that uh, there should be some benefits at community level to lead and sustain the DRM and climate approaches, um, which would be uh, economically uh, viable as well. So the traditional model of uh, model of DDM, DRM. Um, alone wasn't sufficient enough. Uh, so, uh, so if we want to build sustainability and uh, achieve the uh, transformational change in the community. So we combined the uh, traditional DRR approach uh, with the market system development uh, to have the dual benefit of risk reduction and uh, economic well-being. Uh, so we also technology uh, through which farmer get income and uh, continue uh, the agriculture and uh, NRM practices. So at the same time, um, land are uh, conserved and uh, protected by uh, 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 by mitigating impact of uh, disaster. Uh, this approach is, approach is uh, uh, named as Nexus in our program. So our program is multi-country and uh, we work on multiple Nexus variety. Uh, which provides uh, a dual benefit uh, to the community. Some of the Nexus product we work uh, on are sugarcane and fodder in Nepal. In Timor Leste, we work in uh, vanilla. And uh, in Indonesia, we are exploring um, lemongrass, avoc uh, avocado, uh, and uh, at the same time, we plan to explore and uh, extend uh, bamboo plantation as well. 
Next slide, please. So in Nepal, we work uh, on fodder as a nexus. Uh, we plant fodder in river, bank, and landslide prone area. Uh, the multi-year fodders roots goes deep in the uh, soil, which protect uh, uh, the land uh, from river cutting and erosion. And uh, in other hand, the fodder is used for uh, feeding the cattle like uh, uh, cow and buffalo. So the nutritious fodder also increases the production of milk, which is uh, sold in uh, the chilling center by the farmer for an income. So um, seeing the dual benefit, uh, communities have continued the uh, fodder plantation in river banks and uh, uh, area of uh, 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 landslide for area. Use the risk of disaster and uh, community have an alternative livelihood option as well. So in this process, we also strongly uh, apply gender and social inclusion. Uh, we make sure the participation of female, marginalized and uh, disadvantaged group in the decision-making process. Um, next slide, please. Stefan. Stefan just dropped off. Uh, just we are waiting for a while. I think he is back. Stefan, are you there? Uh, sorry, I just had an internet issue there. I hope you can hear me now. Yeah, yeah, Stefan. Yes, uh, in Uganda, we are taking a multifaceted approach to try and address the problem you saw earlier of flooding in Boise. So we are putting the community at the center in uh, solving the issue of uh, poor waste management. But how are we doing this? We are trying to attach value to waste. If we are saying uh, the government can't come in to help uh, dispose of the waste uh, because people can't pay for it, what can we do locally? solve the problem. So first of all, uh, we have used um, creative ways to raise awareness. For example, uh, community training sessions, as well as uh, videos run on local TV, but also gone ahead to train the groups in waste sorting, such that uh, when they collect plastics, uh, they can be sold for an income. And we have also gone ahead to, to train them on how to dry and convert organic waste into briquettes by using low tech. So this way they are able to use the uh, briquettes for cooking, but also to sell it to get an income. And this income is a uh, directly and mostly benefiting women because most of our groups are comprised of women. Like I told you, uh, most times uh, their roles confine them at home and it's the men who go to towns for work and all that. So we have mainly looked at the women here uh, through creation of groups and making sure they also get an income to raise their uh, social economic status in the community. Um, we are not only uh, working with the community because uh, if they collect the plastics, where does it then go? And this is where we are bringing in other stakeholders like the private sector. But also uh, when you go back to the problem, there was an issue of uh, inadequate drainage channels. However much we say that we are going to work on the issue of waste management and improving behavior, uh, uh, we can't do much about the drainage channels. And that's where the government comes in. And we are trying to do this uh, through stakeholder workshops to bring these people together so that uh, 
the gap is not so big between uh, politicians and the people they are serving. So through these workshops, we are able to uh, give a platform to the community to raise voices, but also to get to know what is going on. But at the same time, also inviting the private sector and linking it to the groups, for example, to buy uh, plastics since they are recycling companies. Some are also protect manufacturing companies. So through such uh, workshops, we are bringing the different actors together to try and solve this problem. And the fact that uh, we are including aspects of value and benefits for example, the community is uh, selling the products, but uh, the private sector, to some extent, is getting raw material. So you realize that uh, it's a win-win situation for everyone, and this is something that will remain sustainable even beyond the project timeline. Back to you, Ganesh. Next slide, please. I think uh, this one is also the slide of Stefan. So uh, we present two innovative uh, idea from uh, two different country, uh, which seems simple and effective, uh, but we have undergone many different challenges when implementing these approaches. Um, it was uh, it was not only possible uh, from community and project to work uh, on a whole market value chain uh, in a remote part of the country. Thus, uh, we need to engage private sector in this chain, um, but private sector is risk averse and uh, they don't want to invest in uncertainties and uh, the most vulnerable area in the population. So uh, we wanted to hear from you. Uh, I, it's our session is uh, innovation for adaptation. Uh, what innovative approach can be brought up uh, to invite uh, involved private sector uh, to overcome this challenge? So we will again use Manti uh, for this discussion. Uh, 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 you can log in uh, www.menti.com and uh, uh, Passcode uh, 400 uh, 9422. Stephen, please uh, again, you can drop uh, the password, password and uh, menti, uh, link up menti. So we will uh, wait again uh, two minutes to hear you uh, for your innovative idea. So uh, we get uh, some idea creating the win-win situation for private sector involving uh, their CSR funds. So then how they create impact and money uh, do the legwork providing seed funding uh, to test new market ideas, private sector engagement. Um, make involvement different, different uh, intervention and uh, collaborate to overcome these challenges. So again, uh, thank you uh, everyone for the wonderful and uh, brilliant ideas. 
So first we hear from uh, Stefan, what Uganda did to overcome uh, this challenge and uh, followed it by Nepal. Stefan, please. Next slide, please. Stephen, you are muted. Sorry about that. So Stephen, we tried. You are muted. Yes, Ganesh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, so we try to bridge this gap of how do we bring the private sector on board, as well as the government, because we need both of them. One first thing we did was to uh, schedule a stakeholders workshop where we invited all responsible actors as far as YC is concerned, but also the private sector, uh, especially those involved in the waste management system. So during this workshop, we were able to show the potential that can be harnessed from these communities. For example, uh, we had recyclers, but they had no idea where to find the plastics they need to do their work. So during this workshop, uh, we were able to connect them with the groups in Boise, the women groups which are collecting plastics. And this way, we are able to link them to the market. So it's a win-win situation because the groups uh, are getting the market for their collected plastics, but the private sector is also uh, getting raw materials for their work. And during the same uh, workshop, we are also having uh, the government and it's giving the community an opportunity to voice their concerns with floods directly and also get to hear from what the government has to say. So that is how uh, for us, we brought the different stakeholders on board and showed them how each and every actor can benefit because I mean, if you're having community uh, take on their waste to make useful products, it means you're reducing on the tonnage of community of waste in the community. And this is something that the government also benefits from because there's a very burden as far as waste management and landfills is concerned. So this is the approach we used to bring uh, the private sector as well as government on board. Um, so in Nepal, uh, previously in the communities of Nep uh, communities, uh, there was no culture of milk selling. Uh, people consume the milk uh, for their own purpose. Uh, but after the intervention, interest on this livelihood option was increased. Uh, initially, community had uh, limited knowledge of dairy market system. So to make them understand uh, about the uh, detailed uh, dairy market value chain, we conducted a market assessment. Uh, through this assessment, we found key actors, uh, their functions and the interlinkage between them. And uh, same time, uh, this has also supported to identify uh, the key capacities, uh, constraints and incentive of each actor. So here, uh, here are some uh, key, uh, key actor of uh, dairy, uh, dairy market uh, value chain. And uh, you can see the red highlighted line here. It means there was a, a constraint and gaps between uh, actors and their, uh, their function. So we facilitated uh, uh, the issue and challenge through uh, meetings uh, interaction, training, uh, subsidy mobilization, and uh, also we influence the uh, government of uh, local government for uh, favorable policy and laws. So as uh, incentivizing uh, private sector was our strategy, uh, we worked uh, to buy their uh, risk along with motivating and creating 
uh, and uh, an environment for sustaining their investment through community ownership uh, for mobilizing the market and the linking up uh, with um, multi-sector actors. Um, uh, it not only uh, included the dairy sector, uh, but also uh, the microfinance institution and uh, insurance companies. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, while working with private sector, uh, it was also realized uh, that the engagement and uh, partnership with the government uh, stakeholder is very important for sustainability. So we also facilitated uh, the linkage between key government actors uh, related to dairy value chain. Um, this had created a strong linkage uh, between uh, the multiple actors of disaster and uh, uh, climate adaptation in the ground. Next slide, please. So, um, seeing the uh, enthusiasm and uh, uh, replication of uh, this model in the community and uh, understanding the dual benefit, uh, finally, local governments has uh, forward to take uh, the leadership for this model and uh, have increased its uh, investment. Um, they, they have invested in uh, incentivizing private sector in uh, uh, dairy sector through introducing policies, uh, subsidy, um, infrastructure equipment support, uh, capacity building, customer care service. So um, government is also um, promoting fodder plantation and uh, um, bioengineering uh, for disaster risk mitigation and uh, conservation uh, of eroded uh, chain in the community. So we have been uh, seeing uh, the government's uh, uh, positive interest, uh, private sector's uh, enthusiasm, and uh, community people's willingness uh, for adaptation uh, of dairy sector as alternative livelihood option, and uh, using nexus model uh, for risk mitigation, and uh, uh, the kinds of their vulnerable and degraded lands. So we see the community have uh, moved towards sustainability through uh, the ownership and leadership of uh, the local government and. Uh, uh, is working to build their resilience in the face of, of uh, uncertainties due to climate change and the uh, natural disasters. So now we will be showing a short two minute video of two country, uh, countries related to our presentation and then we will wrap up. Uh, we are not hearing the audio. Subo? Yes, I am sure. Uh, isn't the audio uh, hearable? Mm, the audio from that is not hearable. Can you share the audio? When you share the screen, share the audio as well. Yes, yes. I think you need to we go share back. that. Yeah. yeah. Share it again with the with the option of sharing the audio. In between, you can ask questions or can give feedback to our presenters. Please use the chat function. We'll pick the questions to yeah, Hilly area. Hilly areas in the far western part of Nepal often face problems of flood, river cutting, and landslide during monsoon. This often causes serious destructions like loss of lives, agricultural land, and property. Realizing this, Mercy Corps developed an innovative approach which not only promoted conservation of land and mitigation of disaster through bioengineering technique, but also helped in the economic well-being of the community 
through fodder plantation in riverbank and landslide prone areas. This approach is known as the next this approach. The plantation of fodder brought dual benefit with it. In one hand, it protected the land from disaster and in the other hand, it was being used to feed cattle like cows. The nutritious fodder also helped increasing the production of milk. The community has started selling the produced milk to the chilling centers. The interest in this livelihood option has also increased drastically. Initially, the community had very limited knowledge of dairy market system. For this, Emirate conducted a market assessment. and also linked the community with key actors like the local government and also private dairy industries. We have seen the government's positive interest and private sector's enthusiasm to invest in dairy sectors. Also, in order to conserve their land, the community have moved towards sustainability and building resilience. Amazing at Gatambula, Kati, Netuberanga, even to your finger, you know, Nick. Climate change is the greatest challenge of our time. For an effective response, we need strong partnerships. Cities Alliance is supporting local initiatives to adapt to climate change in informal settlements across the world. Here are their voices. Bawaisi is one of the biggest informal settlements in Uganda's capital, Kampala. And as in other parts of the world, Residents are suffering from the effects of climate change. In most cases, we ignore the impacts of climate change on cities and especially slums. Due to poor waste disposal and inadequate drainage systems, people in the community constantly face the impacts of floods. The resultant flooding negatively impacts the livelihoods of the people in these communities, exposes them to waterborne diseases, with the support of Cities Alliance, Tree Adoption Uganda is implementing the Waste Management for Flood Control project. It aims to sensitize and educate Bawaisi's residents on waste management. We are training members of this community on waste management and especially waste segregation. Bawaisi's residents are now putting a value on their waste and garbage. <laughs> Briquettes can either be sold or they can be used for cooking domestically. Other community members are also making a profit from selling used plastic. In Bawaisi, waste is now looked at as an opportunity instead of a problem, and residents are working with local government for flood control solutions. The community is becoming more resilient and finding new ways to make a living. Thank you, Ganesh and Seven, for this wonderful examples and sharing your experience.
Uh, if you want to learn more about their works, you can visit the marketplace. Uh, as both of the organization has shared their stories on the marketplace as well. So please go to the marketplace and see their stories. Uh, we have some observations and questions from the chat as well. So uh, just a quick question. We will go through some few questions only from our audience. Uh, so the first question is for Ganesh. So Ganesh, how were you able to link up the farmer group to insurance and microfinance? So what is your strategy uh, to link them to insurance and microfinance? And you can add like uh, the, uh, the other question from Peter. Uh, it was a question from Christopher. And there is a question from Petra as well that uh, are the dairy farmers organized? They have some cooperatives or similar thing. Can you please just briefly highlight on it? Um, so I will go first, uh, the insurance, uh, company and, uh, MFI. And so first, uh, uh, in our project, we, uh, in, in Nepal, uh, insurance was, uh, catalyst insurance was started, uh, just six years ago. Uh, it is just initial phase, uh, and, uh, um, many of the community have uh, no knowledge about cattle insurance. So uh, for cattle insurance, we uh, organized training, uh, 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 post collaboration with the insurance company and the local government. And uh, we trained some insurance agent uh, um, locally. And uh, uh, then we uh, started insurance uh, in our working area. Uh, so also, uh, we have uh, 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 various uh, type of uh, MFI, uh, some of the cooperative and uh, some of uh, microfinance institution. And, uh, and uh, um, in our community, we have also access of bank. So uh, we also uh, organized some training and orientation for our uh, uh, partnership and uh, uh, we uh, support to link uh, 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 them to a microfinance institution for uh, uh, loan and uh, saving service. So the second question, I think uh, we have a dairy group in our community and uh, they, they, they are registered in local government and uh, uh, local uh, government institution uh, so that they get a, a, a service from uh, the local government. So Sushla, so what is the next? Uh, yeah, what, are they like organized? They have the groups or what is the modality? They have cooperatives or not the farmer? Are they organized? Yeah. They are not, uh, they are just a group and they are not uh, cooperative. Uh, the group is registered in local government. Uh, uh, so they are not cooperative. They are just only a group, organized group. Okay, thanks so much, Ganesh. Uh, there are a few questions for Stefan as well. Stefan, uh, uh, also uh, you guys can respond on the chat box itself. People are asking like how, uh, what is the market demand of the briquettes? Uh, Anupama is asking if COVID has created a problem with your work on the ground, how you overcome that challenges. And uh, what is the waste management challenges right now? Do you see the possibility of a scale up? Herma is also asking about it. So can you just brief on it, Stefan? Yes, uh, uh, there's a number of questions. I'll begin with the one by Ashmita on indicators. So uh, we, we use, uh, we use uh, an M and E tool, and we are able to to know uh, how many and which stakeholders have we engaged um, in our workshops. First of all, uh, what's the number of uh, stakeholders who have been uh, engaged in the activities? But uh, that's not enough. We go ahead to see how the different stakeholders are contributing to solve the problem we are addressing. For example, uh, how many tons of plastics have been bought by uh, a private recycling company? Uh, 
how much char has been uh, bought from the groups uh, by, uh, by the briquette making companies. And we we'll go ahead to even uh, assess how much money have the groups gained from selling the plastics? How much money have they uh, saved by using briquettes instead of buying charcoal or using electricity among others? Uh, there was also uh, a question uh, from Shama uh, asking if briquettes are safe for use. Yes, briquettes are very safe uh, to use. The only uh, question mark is during their uh, during the charring process because it involves some burning of the organic waste to convert it into the carbon. So we are making a study on this and also comparing and the antibiotic so. uh, antibiotic resistance. No, I'm gonna be I'm not gonna take it unless I need it. But I'm gonna uh, someone yeah. Yeah, Stephen, carry on please. Yes, so uh we are uh, carrying out a study to study further on uh the impacts of converting this uh, dry organic waste into char, but also relating it to the other forms of energy to try and come up with the uh, best option, which we, we highly believe is the briquettes. And uh, there was also another question on uh, challenges in the market. Yes. Uh, uh, this, the use of briquettes uh, is not so common, but it's growing each and every day because uh, there has been a lot of deforestation and there are no more trees to produce charcoal. So waste has become a very good option uh, for making energy and going forward, it really looks uh, promising as far as the market for briquettes is concerned. Then, yeah. uh, uh, Stephen, I, uh, as we are running out of the time, I'm just holding on it and just asking you a quick uh, last question for both of you. So Hasta is asking uh, how uh, actively community are engaged in waste management and do you see like sustainability and replication of this action to other project area as well? And I want to ask the same question to Ganesh as well. So how does the community are engaged on it? And do you see sustainability and replication to other communities in your working area? Stephanie, you can go ahead and then Ganesh can join it. Yes, I mean, what we have done here is build intrinsic motivation. The community is seeing value in waste. We are actually seeing problems like someone has stolen my waste, someone has taken away my, my dry organic waste. So there's a lot of value attached to waste because of the valuable products associated with it. And uh, this is something which will go on even beyond the project timeline and hence sustainability due to the availability of market. Uh, Ganesh? Um, so um, there was a uh, issue in the market, especially uh, when we uh, started our program. And uh, same time also there was a big challenge of uh, disaster. So uh, as uh, I shared in my presentation, uh, we, we focused on Nexus approach and uh, so the community uh, have a dual benefit. So uh, we started uh, from uh, uh, fodder plantation in uh, a rich area and uh, same time we also promote the improved breed cow farming uh, so initially initially there was a big issue uh, um, even uh, an insurance uh, transportation milk transportation and uh, 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 and uh, so many issues are there so uh, we facilitated uh, the issue and uh, uh, we uh, Organized combinedly uh, training, meeting, orientation, and interaction with local government, and uh, uh, finally uh, uh, the dairy sector is growing day by day, and uh, uh, the government also increased uh, uh, its uh, subsidy uh, 
each year. Uh, so now uh, in, 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 in our starting, uh, uh, there was a, a very limited uh, area covered by uh, folder. Now you can uh, see more than uh, 400 uh, road money, I don't know, but uh, uh, in the number in hectare. So uh, the plantation area also increased and uh, uh, dairy farmers are also increased and we started 37 liter per day uh, collection of milk and now it uh, goes to 3000 liter per day and uh, uh, local chilling center is export the milk uh, milk uh, uh, to, dar uh, to large dairy industries uh, especially in Dhangari and Kathmandu so uh, so the the finally government also uh, uh, increased uh, the uh, investment in dairy sector. So we can see uh, the dairy sector is uh, uh, going to in uh, sustain, sustain. Yeah. Thank, thanks. Thanks so much, Ganesh. Uh, Stefan and Ganesh, there are questions for you on the chat box. You can respond the answers in the chat box itself. We are running a little bit late, yeah, so we just want to jump up to the other part of the session. Thank you so much, uh, Ganesh and Stefan, for this wonderful presentation and sharing your stories. Uh, Subo, can we go to the slides, please? Uh, the breakout group slide? Yeah, yeah. So I know you guys are excited to join the breakout room and discuss further about how we innovate uh, to develop the sustainability and ownership in this multiple actor nature of CBA. So we will be breaking into three groups now and uh, let's be in their shoes, shoes of the one, the, the one you, you will be in the group of like Sue of the, uh, be in the shoes of the government, be in the shoes of the private sector or the community. So uh, we will be breaking out the group in a random basis. Uh, so uh, we, we will be addressing uh, two key questions in the breakout room. Next, please. Subo. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, you will be randomly pressed, pressed on the breakout room. So we'll be discussing being a government, being a private sector and being a community or CSO on the group. So how to involve and improve the uh, ownership sustainability of multiple actor natures of CBA. Uh, so we'll have these three groups. So uh, for each of it, we have like two key questions to be reflected back. So one is the perspective from the presentation just shared by Stefan and Ganesh. And on second, how, you'd, how would you ensure that your group will innovate for community-based adaptation discourse? So if you are a government, how will you innovate for this multiple actor uh, uh, innovation for community-based adaptation discourse? So uh, this the group will be uh, room one for government, will, which will be moderated by Susan. Uh, room two, private sector, will be moderated by Anupama from Morshikor. And room three, the CSOs and community will be moderated by Stefan from Tree Adoption. So I request uh, Subo to uh, break, uh, break the rooms. So please join the breakout rooms and see you all in 15 minutes. Uh, let me recheck. Uh, the government will lead by Unupoma and private sector by- uh, Government Susan. will be led by Susan and the private sector will be led by Anupama. Okay. And we request you to unmute yourself in the discussion. If if you if time allows, you can introduce yourself uh, and your feedback and questions as well. So uh, finally, we are back to the plenary room, and I hope you had a very fruitful and wonderful discussion around being a government, being a private sector, or being a community. How we can involve multiple actors on community-based adaptation. So what can be the options that will be available? What can be the innovative approach that we can bring forward and share to the larger audience as well from your projects that you are doing on, on multiple countries uh, throughout the globe? Uh, so we will, uh, I think you have already finalized who is the speaker for your group. So we'll start with the government. 
uh, so for government who will be volunteering uh, for uh, for being a speaker room one thank you government Suraj from Mexico uh, will represent us thank you okay okay thank you thank you so from group one I will be presenting our group idea so uh, for the feedback, what we discussed in our group is uh, it was a, a good, nice presentation from both the country and uh, was innovative idea. But uh, uh, somehow our group have focused and mentioned about like we didn't have um, much uh, role seen in the government side from the both presentation. So if we have more like uh, what was the government role uh, in engaging on those both a uh, project would be a great and uh, also uh, how the uh, multi stakeholder partnership were possible for dairy and also the waste management in uganda so it, it was some uh, our 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 few members want to learn more about that how it was possible to bring all the uh, a stakeholder in one place. And uh, also we talked about the how, how can we inst institutionalize those uh, thing uh, for the sustainability. And uh, as, uh, as, as when uh, we leave the program, the operations of both uh, will run in, in long term. And for the government uh, involvement, uh, we had uh, some discussions like uh, when we uh, start our project uh, in, the since in the beginning of our starting, uh, we have to engage government when we expect uh, their collaboration and support involvement in our uh, working uh, modality. We have to assure their presence in our planning phase. Also, we have talked about uh, like, uh, every country have government planning process. So we have to consider those government planning process as well. Uh, and uh, we have to assure our plans and our uh, uh, policy are also recognized by government planning process. And they uh, put this, uh, our project activity in their plan as well, so that it, it can be regularized. And also uh, they will continually support our interventions. Uh, and also some uh, like uh, we heard about our group member is uh, uh, when there is a lot of role of CSO in every country and uh, contributing to government. So government also should recognize the role of CSO and uh, uh, be specific like what role they can play in the, this, this kind of project. So these are the key things I uh, noted down. If there is anything else, uh, our group member, I would request our group member to add on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saroz. Uh, do somebody from the group want to reflect on some missing points or we want to move ahead? Okay, so yeah, very good uh, points. Uh, how to introduce the thing, uh, the planning phase, involvement from the planning phase and specific requirements on how to support the CSOs as well. Uh, very good points I, uh, over there. Uh, for private sector, we want to go to uh, Anupama. Is that correct? Anupama from Mercy Corps. Are you volunteering for yes. the private sector speaker? Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, yes. So when our group discussed about the involvement of the private sector, we came like uh, we came with a few points. Like there should be a good subsidy mobilization. If you are uh, piloting some new um, uh, new things in the communities and you are involving a new actor, there should be some subsidy as well. And the next one was there should be a group efforts uh, so that it will be easy uh, in the future to institutionalize those groups. Um, and work with them. And the third one was uh, securing the profit of the private sector because uh, private sector, they look uh, for and they, they seek for the profits of their own business. So there should be some uh, secure profit for the private sector engagement. Uh, 
and uh, engaging the actors uh, with the same uh, aims and goals. Uh, if we are having the same aims and goals like uh, the project and the partner, then uh, private sector, then it will be easy uh, to reach, uh, reach our goals and aims. Uh, the fourth one was economic uh, partnership with the private actors for involving them in the projects and complying with the government rules as well. Because uh, later on, um, if we partner uh, with the private sector and we, we do not comply with the government, that it can be the problem. So we should look for the, those kind of private actors which comply with the government rules as well. And uh, only uh, only one private actor or one stakeholder is not enough while we are uh, working in the market. So we need to look uh, for the multi-stakeholders private sector's engagements. And uh, we should also focus on the interest of the private sectors, like what are their needs, their requirements, and does they comply with the projects and we can go together or not. So these were some of the points we discuss in our private sector teams. Thank you so much, Anupama. If I missed, my, uh, I think the team members will add. Does somebody want to add any points? Thank you so much for these private sectors uh, point of view uh, to the session. Uh, can we go for the third group, uh, the community and CSOs? Speaker from, yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, so we had mainly questions that came out from our discussion um, and it sort of started with um, talking about how can the private sector um, support the support uh, CSOs to uptake technologies to um, increase community based adaptation. So agricultural technologies, for example, because it's, um, there was a point made that it's very difficult to get communities to use the new technologies that are available. And then we had another point. Um, which was sort of about how how were the community sort of involved in the process of deciding the solutions? Were they involved in, for example, deciding, you know, to plant avocados um, and lemongrass? So there were sort of the two sides that were discussed in terms of how do you get communities to use solutions and how much were the communities um, involved in finding the solutions and sort of sharing solutions that maybe they'd already tried. And then we had a final point with um, sort of a question around what's the difference between what's the difference between a livelihood project um, and the private sector with um, sort of communities. Um, what's the difference in, in sort of livelihood supporting community based adaptation and uh, the private sector. So our discussion was mainly about questions. Thanks so much, uh, Sydney, for uh, the questions that you raised. It's, uh, it's really a valid point that how this all carbon. Uh, engaged through and how this is different from a livelihood approach rather than involvement and engagement of private sector. Yeah, thank you for all of this. Uh, so um, uh, it was a great uh, uh, insight. Uh, do any of uh, the additional participants want to share something uh, from your group or do you want to move ahead? Maybe okay. Susila, uh, yeah. can I answer the some of the questions that yeah, the sure, 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 okay. sure please. Um, yeah, I think one of the one of the key principle of community based adaptation is we see community as an ex, as an expert. Yeah, they know their situations and 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 as an external agency, sometimes we go with the solutions. The the solution might already exist in the community, and and all of these some of the work examples that you were sharing like. like and grass, whether it's like avocado or sugarcane or dairy, those were the things like that already existing in the in the area, and and we are learning from community as well. And but what we were saying is, what are those opportunities uh, for the private sector engagement, uh, so that we can take some of those good practices into scale? Um, you know, people might be. You know, as avocado or lemongrass, those are not the new thing that already existed in that area. But uh, you know, how we, it's, it is not about what we plan, but how we plan, how we assess that, you know, how the impact of climate change, how do, uh, what are the risks associated with the climate change and how can we introduce some of these um, practices to make it more um, climate risk sensitive. And, and what could be an incentive for uh, private sector to engage in that uh, those sectors? And, and for uh, in those programs, 
normally what we do is you know, we we try to understand the whole market system. And I think that there is where the differences between the livelihood and market again, uh, my private sector engagement is. Uh, in in our in the livelihood uh, focused approach, like we, we go to the community, we train them, we try to promote some crops or agriculture techniques, and that's all. But when with the uh, broader in the private sector engagement or the market system development approach that we call, we try to understand the the whole market system, uh, whole market value chain, starting from the producer to the end uh, um, end users as well, and, and map out what are those other private sectors or other government actors who add values to the, to the that particular market system. And that defines the strategy, who should be engaged and what are the incentive for engagement. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chet, for this quick uh, uh, sharing of uh, what uh, the, the questions were raised from the, uh, the groups over there. So, uh, so that's a really wonderful discussion and insight. So I would like to highlight a key few points that was discussed in today's session. It was a wonderful session and we got to hear from different perspective from civil societies, from government, from donors, from private sector itself. So uh, we, we, today we hear that uh, business as usual will not work. It was a great, great thought because yeah, we have been trying a lot and we have been failing a lot as well. So uh, yeah, that, that's, the, uh, that's the area where we want to encourage and involve is that we need to do business a different, uh, uh, differently and we need to involve private sector engagement on this uh, discussion and discourse. Uh, CBA has started uh, involving and uh, inviting private sector on the conferences uh, from CBA 12. So it's not being a long history for us to invite the uh, private sector on this climate change debate and discourse. Uh, so it's just been like, uh, and it's, it's just been like few years and we're still trying to pull and, uh, and see that what, what, uh, what things uh, we can offer. Like as Sandra was mentioning, there should be value on it. There should be impact and money associated, both making an impact and making money was the key to involve private sector engagement. So that was the key point that uh, that was raised, and and that also in the cost of uh, working to the vulnerable groups. Uh, so while promoting private sectors, we should also uh, make sure that it will also support the poor and the marginalized and the most vulnerable populations are benefited. Uh, it's not only private sector making the money. So it was great hearing about the two countries and the multi-stakeholder nature that uh, involves the private sector and the government as well, and moving towards sustainability. So uh, yeah, uh, so it was, uh, uh, and, the, and the group also shared about how government should be uh, dealing with it, like uh, planning uh, involvement of all the multi-stakeholder actors from the, uh, from the planning process itself. So they have this ownership and they have this uh, idea of uh, having multi-stakeholder nature. And also uh, the private sector group also mentioned about how the subsidizing mo uh, subsidy mobilizations could be done uh, for, and also not focusing on a single private sector, but also focusing on multiple private sectors and not the big enterprises, also the micro and small enterprises. Uh, or, as they are also, uh, they have, they also are climate. They also have like this climatic shocks also affect them. And now we have like this dual uh, situation going on: COVID shock along with this the climate shocks. So this is the high time. As uh, Chet also mentioned in his uh, keynote that this is the high time we see a multi-stakeholder engagement on climate actions and discourse. So. Uh, I think this is not the end of the discussion. The discussion is, has just begun and just initiated. And we hope that we will have this discussion throughout the CBA 15 and beyond CBA as well in the other forums as well. So this need to be uh, the talk of the hour. This need to be a very, um, uh, we need to have like a very successful and encouraging multiple actor engagement um, on community-based adaptation. So, so that we will be uh, having this fair and equitable society where all the actors will be working on for the benefit, benefit of the uh, community and the society at large. So 
uh, with this, we will want to close our session today. And I would like to thank each and every of you for your uh, time and for your active participation. And uh, hope you will have a wonderful CBA experience and also discuss about how to pull the private sector in this discourse. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Last slide, please, Subo. Subo, can you can you move to the last slide, please? Yeah. Thank you, everyone Thank from you, Triad Adoption, Uganda and Mashiko. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so Thanks, much. Bye. 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 Sheila, can we keep the core group behind? Okay, sure. Thanks, everyone. Okay, great, great session there. Um, can you see me? Yeah. Ah, great. You, you did great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, I feel like we got so much wisdom from this session and I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, can we use five to 10 minutes to recap on the key messages? Sure. Um, sure. From our rapporteur. Yeah. Uh, our rapporteur is facing internet issues today. She is like up and down, but I think we have Anupama with us. Anu, are you with us? No. Uh, okay, but we can pull the, pull the keynotes. That's not a problem with it, yeah. We have Chet with us. Yeah, Chet, are you with uh -huh. us? Yes, he is. Yeah. Okay, so I actually thought that um, our rapporteur would start us off, uh, but now can, can there she a, can she join a, the chat? Uh, there is a huge rainfall going on, and she she is not connected for the session, so it will be tough to pull her. Yeah. Oh my God, we should have had plan B. What a big yeah. loss. Okay, so now we have to start it from scratch. Um, you have been speaking much. Maybe we can invite Gabriela or Chet to first share your, your thoughts on the key messages you felt were coming out. And by the way, great insights in your keynotes. It was just so, too much wisdom. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Gabriela, are you with us? Hi, yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I had something here. Um, so yeah, it was a great session. I was, I took only a few notes, but what um, came to me as extremely import important was the awareness raising effort that you need to do. And this is something I also brought in the breakout um, session. Um, so how how you, how you do, do you first like bring this um an external knowledge how can i say that you help you help communities and and local governments and private sector as well identify um resources and values that sometimes they didn't know it was there so I think this is one of the key points, and this is why raising awareness is important. It's not 
um, external agents bringing in and, and, and it's not a top-down process. It's not us bringing in knowledge, it's the opposite. It's you creating an environment where you can facilitate that the local knowledge can flourish. And we can really grasp that. So this is one of the key points um, for me. Yeah. Uh, I would... think that's, yeah. that's no, powerful because it, it, it does fit into the question that uh, was asked also in the Mentimeter of the how. How do we do it? And it seems like you really need to start with this. And so we have articulating the how. Perhaps we can get, add a, a, a little more ingredients in there. Um, of, of how else to bring in the, the, the private sector, but I, I, I agree with you, that came out really strongly. I Did you want to add a thing? No, Go just ahead. that something that maybe uh, we couldn't discuss as much was that also um, this needs to be like a circular system. So something that feeds back and, and how are we doing that? But because when we are talking about innovation, when we are talking about experimenting, we shouldn't look at these initiatives exactly the same way as we look at something that is already that we already know how it works. So mm -hmm. we need room for testing, but we also need for this to work. We also need to have very have a very clear um, understanding of how we are doing the learnings, how we are doing the mail, for instance. So Uganda talk a little bit uh, about how they are uh, about the mail framework. Um, but how you are really getting the insights from these um, innovative initia uh, initiatives so you can um, really talk about sustainability, so you can talk about the next steps. You need, for you to replicate, you need to understand what worked, what didn't work, mm -hmm. why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is one aspect that we couldn't um, touch much upon, but... Um, this is maybe a question that we can just leave open um, in yeah. messages. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and, and of course, it's, it's always great to have more questions than answers, but I hear you loud on that. Um, yeah. Okay, I've actually lost my thought thread there. Um, can I invite anyone else <laughs> to sure. step in? Yes, yes. Share. maybe I can share a few things. Um, mm -hmm. The one uh, that the line that uh, or sentence that was catchy was making impact and making money together. Yeah. So, um, and when we talk about uh, a private sector engagement or engagement of government as well, you know, everybody is looking for impact, even for donors. And I say, what, what change do we do? We, can we really bring in? What impact can we really bring in? Um, we have to understand that. And yes, private sector, I think one, in one of the, I think it was Gabriela you who shared, or uh, I forgot, but you know, the emphasis on uh, like who would benefit when we talk about the private sector engagement, then we should we have to think about who would benefit from that how we put people, um, the most vulnerable at the center of what we do. So like our private sector engagement strategy will ultimately benefit the one who are the most vulnerable. And, and like, again, relating with the, you know, uh, when we are um, developing some of these modular approaches, you know, starting from like what climate change is, what, what, what does that climate change impact look like? And and to when and when we are developing a solutions or model around those problems, what are the opportunities for private sector? What is the incentive for them to invest in? Yeah. Otherwise, as uh, as uh, Danish was highlighting in his presentation, the private sector are risk averse. And they don't want to invest in any um, area where they put their investment at risk. You know, and I think there is where it comes again about there was this discussion about subsidy again. How do we how do we you know design the subsidies in a way that it's not creating a dependency rather than you know it, it's it's just creating an environment to just get it started. And 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 once and that start off, let's say, would help us to understand like, oh, there is a business there, there is a money. 
uh, and and that's how you know once that investment is started then they there is that opportunity for scalability. Otherwise, you know, as in development um, actors, we don't have a tons of resources and, and many years, multiple years, just to work, keep working in one community. Yeah. Yeah. Unless these private sectors are connected or government are connected, the sustainability and the scalability piece is, is not going to be achieved. You're on mute. <laughs> I am muted with the excitement. Okay, so um, great, great message in there that is loaded. Um, so at the core of it is we have to be clear of the what the problem is and identify in, in getting a solution, how to make impact and money out of solving that problem. And then that can be informed by key questions such as who will benefit? And when we are creating an incentive, uh, how do we make sure that it doesn't create dependency? Um, yeah. And I see you nodding. Uh, I hear that as a core because hmm, maybe just to add uh, that in, in one of the discussions, somebody said that you have to start with it in mind to bring everybody together. And then you yourself added that we have to look at it from a value chain perspective. Yep. That's what yeah. I hear. Go ahead. Exactly. Exactly. And what that, that's what like, you know, once you start with the problem and then you try to develop a, a model or solution around it, then you start mapping out who are the stakeholders. You know, rather than you enter from stakeholders, you start from a problem and then figuring out like who are the key stakeholders, which is the government or which is the private sectors and what is their interest in that. Then that's how like we can build the partnership. And once they see those incentives in that problem. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. Um, so go ahead. The other, other thing that was like uh, clicking on my mind was uh, the value for something like whether it's community or a private sector or a local government. If they see the value, they will invest in it. So creating the value, creating that enabling environment Creating that thing is a big piece to work on when we when we design uh, this this type of intervention. When we talk about uh, fostering collaboration, this should be our our uh, key area where we should work on. And also uh, also the Sandra was speaking about not thinking of like big investors and big multi companies on private sector. Also like improving and imp uh, empowering the micro enterprises, uh, the small enterprises as well, because they are within the community, they are serving the community at the same time, they are also at risk of uh, different climate shocks. So we also need to like, not only think about like bigger uh, industries and bigger uh, private sectors will also pull in the small enterprises and micro enterprises systems as well. That, that have the dual benefit for both the communities and themselves. Yeah, yeah. And I think that also ties in very well with uh, Gabriela's point. Um, somebody has to show the stakeholders in the value chain the value that they can get from the innovation. Um, that's core. Do we have anything uh, tickling around government? Can we tease out a message around government? In our group, um, uh, first of all, it was said that it didn't come out very well. Uh, there were some insights shared. Um, and at the end of the day, it came out that we must look at the planning cycle and integrate uh, mm -hmm. solutions through the planning cycle. What key message do you feel should come out? Chair? Um, I think during this, the, the design, uh, the sessions, uh, when we started this uh, designing them, you know, we were having this discussion about 
what does that multi-stakeholder mean? Although the title uh, it says that, uh, and like what we should be focusing on. So uh, I think in both both the Uganda and Nepal case, there is a lot of government engagement machinery. Uh, but it, it was just like not much coverage just because like we, we want to highlight definitely multi-stakeholder uh, uh, partnership in, in, the, in the discussions. Uh, but get more focused about the private sector engagement. Um, and I, I agree with that again, like, you know, once uh, once we align with the government, uh, you know, prioritization, planning process, funding cycle, uh, resource allocation uh, um, process, then there is a better opportunity to, you know, leverage more resources from government. Um, and also, um, I think it, it, we didn't highlight it that much, but one of our, our own experiences, you know, as a development organization, like when you are working in this type of sector, you don't have all the expertise. And, and like the government and even the private sector, they brings a lot of technical expertise, knowledge about the business and, and technical know-how in that sector. So uh, that's where the value of uh, they, they bring. So, and it's not only, although we focused about the private, focused on the private sector, but it doesn't mean that there is, there is, there isn't much role of a, uh, a government. In fact, in fact, the, we start with more engagement of government and gradually transition to the private sector because it takes more time for a private sector to, to see those incentives. Um, you know, uh, but government, like they come, it's more like uh, how you how you call it, like uh, like you know, government or like organization. Us, we look from a more of a humanitarian angle, yeah. So even if there is not a profit, then maybe we go there and try to support. And with that, like we try to build that model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like for private sector, uh, yeah, it, it, it takes time to build those relationships, sometimes even to educate and, 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 and convince them to invest in it. Um, if I may add also something, and Susan, this relates to what Fing I think was saying in the breakout session um, about the need as well for civil, civil society to push a little bit um, um, the, the local government is that and here I'm thinking mostly about urban informal settlements the thing is that you cannot act upon something that you do not recognize or you don't don't see officially mm -hmm. and this is often the case with informal settlements so when 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 the, the local government doesn't have the data or uh, does not want to see that the community is really living there and it is there to stay, it creates a problem. So how to, so although we also didn't have the time to go into details, I think this also relates to, to, to our uh, initial discussion in the breakout room. So how mm -hmm. can the civil society also make noise and, and say, listen, we are here, this is our problem. Let's invite them as well to, to work together. So it's a two way street. Of course, it needs to have that enabling environment uh, it would be great if we could count on political will, but this is not always mm. the case. Yeah, totally agree, Gabriela. And I think, yeah, that's the role that civil society should be playing. Yeah. Well, sometimes when you work with the government, like they don't, they don't always look from a profit angle. And when you sometimes work with the private sector, they don't just look, they, they're more for profit, uh, their motive is to make profit. Yeah. But like, how can we bring both them, both the, these two, um, uh, entity, they have a, uh, a huge potential financial and technical expertise to bring in that, um, bring in and, and, and benefit uh, for to scale up the, the approach or model that we do at the community level. So I think that's where like you know, the civil society's role has to be as a facilitator, yeah, trying to understand to show that incentive, why it is important and, and try to be, act as a breeze between these two uh, entity as well. Yeah. Yeah, there, there wasn't time yeah. to discuss it. Okay, that. okay. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, unless there's any others, I am going to take up the challenge to condense these three messages, these messages into three. 
um, because we are required to have three to four messages. And um, while we haven't discussed Susan. here the role, yes. Steven? Uh, sorry, sorry, maybe just before you continue, there are some uh, important points I noted from Gabi. And uh, one of them was uh, a clear understanding of innovation. And uh, she went ahead to explain that understanding what doesn't work uh, whenever we want to scale. Uh, 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 sorry, Susan, I'm just looking for some of the points I noted here. Yes, uh, she said new adaptation of things that already exist. So maybe this can also be another question of asking what already exists. And then uh, creating uh, value and uh, value that works for the community. And then uh, innovation based on local knowledge. I think it's uh, uh, there, there were very important points raised and we can have them included. Okay, um, great. I, I think, yes, they will they'll get in. Perhaps what Gabriela also said that hasn't come out yet and I will integrate in is the role of the donor community and just being intentional on their part to select programs, projects that bring these threads together is very, very important. And so with that, I am going to tease this out into three key messages and I want to share them with you first for your input before then we can share with the organizers later in the day, if that's all right with you. Yeah. Great, right, thanks. Excellent, Great. thank you Great. so much for this. Thank you so much. Nepalese, namaste. Namaste. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.